Continuing the eighth chapter of the book of Romans, starting in the 18th verse, Paul writes, I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we await for adoption the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Friends, this is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. There is a very thin line between genius and idiocy, and that very thin line between genius and idiocy is most clearly illustrated by people who invent things that they want you to buy. Separate you from your money. And some of these, I don't know how popular they became or how present they are in, in your local Target, but these are legitimate creations that can be purchased for those of you looking for early Christmas gift-giving ideas. Idea number one and invention number one, the baby mop. Two, two full-size mop heads sewn into baby clothing so when the kid's down on the floor crawling, they mop or dust your floor. That sounds like, a, that's a Roomba right there with a pacifier, isn't it? That's what that one is. How about pizza scissors? I've actually seen pizza scissors. They are sizzler, scissors and a spatula put together in this wonderful way where you can cut your piece of pizza and then lift it up with the spatula all in one instrument. Don't need to go back to the junk drawer in your kitchen to find the pizza, pizza spatula or sold with the pizza spatula, the Weight Watcher belt. It's got inch marks on it so that you know where you're connecting up and if your waistline is going out or coming back in. One that I really like, I would like to find them. Um, for my family watching this online, this is a legitimate gift for the preacher. LED bedroom slippers. So late at night when you're going in the refrigerator to get the, you know, the last bite of pie that's sitting in there and you've got these cute little LED lights on your slippers so you don't bust a toe on the piece of furniture that the dog moved and you weren't aware that the dog moved the piece of furniture or worse. Stepping on a dog bone. You ever stepped on a dog bone? It's as bad as stepping on a Hot Wheels car in the middle of the night. Then someone came in, came up with the uh, No Place Like Home shoes. No Place Like Home. They're leather shoes. They have um, GPS device in them, and you can program your shoes with your destination in them so that your shoes will guide you along your walk. That way, if you're out walking and you get lost, your shoes will always make sure you find your way home. That's cool. But I was thinking we needed to modify the um, no place like home shoes, and we need to create God shoes. I think we need God shoes that are going to keep us on the path of righteousness, and if you're about to get off the path of righteousness, bright red lights start flashing up on your shoes. Or your God shoes can come equipped with an air horn. And when somebody says bad, something bad to you and you're about to unload and say something equally nasty to them, the air horn goes off 
and it covers up what you've just said so they don't hear it and you're reminded to turn the other cheek and curb your tongue. I think God's shoes, they're biblical. They're helpful. They might get us through this life we're living faithfully. Eugene Peterson in a book entitled Eat This Book, said that we respond to the Word of God, we interact with the Bible, not with our ears, not with our eyes, but with our feet. I'm really a Christian. Do your feet show it? Are they taking you to the places that Christ wants you to go? Are they keeping you out of the places that are detrimental to your Christian walk and witness? We live out our Christian faith. Our feet will take us on the journey. The psalmist begins the entire book of Psalms with the first psalm that, that sets out the agenda for those songs, if you will. The psalmist says, Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers. Did you know there was a progression there that we are not following the advice or taking the path, and the word take the path is the Hebrew verb to linger. Linger. Or sit in the seat of scoffers. I went to seminary in New Orleans, and one of the things you do as a New Orleans seminary student is you are involved in street ministry, and there were several of us involved in street ministry on a street named Bourbon. And on Bourbon Street, you don't do street ministry by yourself. You do it in pairs or in quads because being down there by yourself can get you sucked into what's going on down there. And... Um, uh, there have been lots of nights where I got a call from a friend that I need you to ride with me to the Mississippi Gulf Coast. Um, one of the workers had agreed to come off the street and we, we would get them in treatment facilities. And um, y'all, you just won't believe what that industry does to people. And some of these children... We couldn't take back home. We had to find treatment for them. So I was used to being on Bourbon Street. And Bourbon Street is no big deal once you understand how insidious what goes on down there really is. But conventions would come to New Orleans. And I laughingly say that while I was in seminary and for the time I lived in New Orleans, Twice, twice the Southern Baptist Convention came to New Orleans. And in 1989, they came to New Orleans for the convention. In 1990, they went to Las Vegas for their convention. And I hadn't figured out if they were trying to convert the sinners or do sin research. Why were they hanging out in those two places? But conventions would come to New Orleans. And some of us who were working down there would know when a convention was in town and when their afternoon session would release when the um, big meal was and when those conventioneers were likely to be on Bourbon Street. You see, there's a block between Canal Boulevard, well, Canal Boulevard and Iberville. There's this block between them that nothing's there. There's a Walgreens on this side and a wall on this side. And the conventioneers would turn the corner at Canal and you could see them that they were kind of giving advice to each other the way that guys at a convention in New Orleans giving advice to each other. And it's like this. I will if you will. Nobody will know. I will if you, are you going to? I'll, I'll go, I'll, if you will, I will. Okay, yes, let's go. And you would watch them. And so we would kind of get in behind them because we knew what was going to happen. In these certain clubs on Bourbon Street, the only way to describe it is clothes fall off of people. I don't know how it happens, but clothes fall off of people. And when the clothes had fallen off the people, there were 
folks standing at the door that would throw the door open so you could look in the, the place where the clothes had proceeded to fall off somebody. And the guys were going, look at that. They don't have that in Mississippi. Look at that. And the, they'd open the doors and the guys are walking down the street and they're looking and they're kind of looking like this and they're kind of looking like that. And we get about two blocks in Bourbon, and what would happen is they would fling the doors open, and the guys would start lingering. They were no longer walking, they were gawking. And about that time, this guy group of six or seven guys, some guys had started peeling off. They had realized they didn't need to be down there. They didn't need to see any more than they were going to have to confess they had already seen. Their faith was in danger. but they would keep on walking. And if you watched them long enough, you knew that the further in on bourbon you got, the longer the doors stayed open, and the more bold the guys standing at the doors would be in their pitch to get fellas to come in. And there would always be the one who would stop walking, stop lingering, and walk in one of those places. I know, because as a minister, I've had to deal with the other side of it. The preacher, you won't believe what my husband did on that convention trip. I always remember the one that found a summons in her husband's coat pocket been arrested for soliciting at a convention. The psalmist was warning people, your feet will get you in trouble. Your feet will take you places you have no business being. We need God shoes to keep us out of these places. We need God shoes to guard the journey we're on. Because the journey starts way back when they first turned right on Canal Street, off of Canal onto Bourbon. They didn't think they were doing anything wrong. They were just going down there to find out what all the hoopla about Bourbon Street is. They may get them adult beverage, and they, after all, were going to one of the bars where the jazz music was playing. Uh-huh. The writer of Judges says there arose a time when everybody in Israel did whatever they thought was right. The prophet Isaiah said, all we like sheep have gone astray. We turned everyone to our own way. We've just figured out what we ought to do and we're going to do it. If you don't like the fact that we're, going, we're doing it, we're going to scream that you don't understand us that you're not compassionate or empathetic. And Paul, as he starts the letter of the Romans, says, For though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. 
but they became futile in their thinking and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and they exchanged the glory of an immortal God for images resembling human beings or birds or four-legged animals or reptiles. Therefore, God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to the degrading of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. Paul, in starting out the book of Romans, says, look, there's another side to this coin out there. There's the dark side. There is the one that is the deceiver who wants to drive you away from God into a place of death. He started the eighth chapter by telling us, look, Unless you rebrand yourselves, you're going to be living life in the flesh. You're going to have a self-centered, self-serving, fractious, autonomous relationship with yourself. It's going to be about you, what you think, what you believe, what you think others ought to believe. And the result of that kind of living is death. And he's telling that to people in Rome the center of the Roman Empire. And he calls them and he calls us in the 8th chapter to rebrand ourselves to claim not this fleshly life that's hostile to God, that cannot please God, but claim life in the Spirit, to claim our heritage as children of God. Do you remember as a parent Your child had just learned to walk. They were toddling around and you were so proud of them walking. And eventually that little one would discover your shoes. And they would stick their feet in mommy or daddy's shoes and they would walk around in mommy or daddy's shoes. Shoes way too big for them. But they were so proud they got their feet in the shoes. Mommy, look at me. Daddy, look at me. I'm wearing your shoes. I'm proud now because I have grandparent shoes, and I'm proud to say the children are doing the same things. They like putting on big shoes that don't fit them. We need to put on God shoes. They're big shoes. They might not fit them, but if we get God shoes, the God shoes will keep us on the right path. They will keep us following Jesus. Jesus said, follow me. He said, take up your cross and follow me. He said, deny yourself and follow me. Be willing to die daily to self and follow me. Serve the world around you and love other people, but follow me. And he talked on the Sermon on the Mount about the wide way that leads to destruction and the narrow hard path that leads to life. And he said, follow me on that narrow way. We need God's shoes so we can follow Jesus, so we can walk in his footsteps, so we can go where he wants us to go. We need to understand that as children of God, we are now heirs of Christ. We have inherited everything that Jesus inherits. We have inherited eternal life. We have inherited resurrection. We have inherited the power of the Holy Spirit residing in us. We have inherited the ability to be faithful. We can use our God shoes to walk where God wants us to go and he will strengthen us and give us the power to take each step along the journey. God shoes going in God's way. So the psalmist says to people, You need to avoid following the advice of the wicked. You need to stop lingering with sinners. And you need to not sit in the seat of of scoffers. But delight yourself in the law of God and meditate on God's law day and night. Because when you do that, you're suddenly like a tree. You're planted by the streams of water. You yield fruit in its season and your leaves do not wither. I want to walk as a child of God. I want to live out a faithful witness to Jesus Christ. I want to live as an heir of the King. 
And when you understand that, when you understand you're a child of God, a joint heir with Jesus, there's nothing missing. You've got everything you need. Everything you need comes as a gift of God. What more do you need than God promising His Spirit will dwell in you and His Spirit will do with you far more abundantly than you can either ask or imagine? How much more could you want or need than far more abundantly than you can ask or imagine? That pretty much covers it all, doesn't it? Do you know you're a child of God? After ordering breakfast in a Gatlinburg, Tennessee uh, hotel, Fred Craddock and his wife, Fred Craddock for years, professor of preaching, a fancy word for that's homiletics. Dr. Craddock and his wife were waiting for the meal to arrive, and they were kind of hoping for a few private moments where husband and wife can actually catch up with each other and find out what was going on. And as they were sitting in the restaurant, they noticed this distinguished gray-headed man just kind of walking around, going from table to table, greeting the people and welcoming them. And um, the professor leaned over and whispered to his wife what every preacher whispers to his wife in search situations like that. He said, baby... I hope he doesn't come over here. But sure enough, there he came right to their table. Where are you folks from? He said in a friendly voice. Oklahoma, they answered. Great to have you here in the good old state of Tennessee, the stranger said. What do you do for a living? Fred Craddock says, I teach seminary. Oh, so you teach preachers how to preach, do you? Well, I've got a really great story for you. With that, the gentleman pulled up the chair and sat down. And at that point, Fred Craddock, the professor of homiletics, is trapped. And he's thinking to himself, great, that's all I need is to hear one more preacher story. The distinguished gentleman pointed out the window and he said, you see that mountain over there? Not far from the base of that mountain. An unwed mother gave birth to a son. And when that boy was six years old, his mama's life got even harder and she found she couldn't keep the boy anymore. So she placed him in an orphanage. And he had a hard time early in his life because it seemed almost everybody he talked to would ask him a question eventually, and the question was, son, who is your daddy? And he said, I didn't know. I couldn't answer the question. And because he couldn't answer that question, the children in the orphanage ostracized him and made fun of him. And he found even at school that that, that he didn't feel like he belonged because he didn't know who his daddy was. And although the little boy started going to church, he did what a lot of other folks do. He snuck in after the church service had started and he snuck out when the pastor was doing the benediction so he wouldn't have to talk to anybody because even at the church, even though they loved him, they knew. And he said, one Sunday this new preacher came to town. It was about the time he was 12 years old. And the preacher did service differently, and and the boy said before he could even get out of the church service, the preacher had already pronounced the benediction, and he found himself walking out of the church service with the rest of the crowd. And he reached the back door where the preacher was, and the new minister, not knowing anything about this young man, put his hand on his shoulder and said, Son, 
Who is your daddy? And some of the members of the congregation heard the question. They became deathly quiet. They knew that that young man was embarrassed. And by the sheepish looks on the face surrounding the young man and by the clear embarrassment of the young man, the minister realized his mistake and, and through Holy Spirit inspiration fixed it quick. He recovered. Still with his hand on the boy's shoulder, he said to him, wait a minute, I see the family resemblance. You're a child of God. You're a son of the king. He said, boy, you have a great inheritance. Now go and claim it. The distinguished gentleman said, you know, that man was never the same again. Whenever anybody would ask him, who's your daddy? He'd answer, I'm a child of God. Isn't that a great story? Fred Craddock, then by, uh, by then genuinely interested, said, it really is. The older man walked away and he remarked, you know, if that new preacher hadn't told me that I was one of God's children, I probably never would have counted or amounted to anything. Fred Craddock, now deeply moved, called the waitress over and asked, who is that guy? Waitress said, everybody around town knows him. He just lives down the road. That's old Ben Hooper, former governor of the state of Tennessee. You are a child of God. You are a son or a daughter of the King of Kings. Put on those God shoes and go where he wants you to go and do what he wants you to do and be what he's called you to be. And you're going to discover the blessings of being a child of God. Would you stand and pray with me? We thank you, O Lord, that all God's children got shoes. And we pray that we would be aware of our God's shoes, of our feet that are taking us on the journey you've called us to, that are taking us to the places you want us to be, that are introducing us to the people who need you. O God, help us to be faithful as we walk in our God's shoes. Amen. Oh,